uh, to a lecture entitled Business as Trust, Corporate Social Responsibility in the Era of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, so I guess the who am I has sort of been done for me. Uh, most recently, however, and currently I'm an Ethics of Artificial Intelligence uh, fellow here at the Center for Ethics. So I just want to say thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, I actually just returned from Paris, where it's sort of normal in August for all the retail shops to kind of close for the month, which I found kind of strange. So I came here anticipating it being a, a much thinner turnout. So thanks to all of you for taking interest in this. Um, but essentially, oh, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I, I'll speak louder. Uh, we have an ambient mic only, so there is a bit more space if you need to come uh, up here. Uh, but is it working? It's on already, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to speak up, and I'm not yelling. <laughs> but uh, essentially, yeah, so I, I do talk fast, and I, do, I can talk loud for these purposes. Uh, the, the book is called The New Business Ethics. Uh, the manuscript is done, uh, but the editing will take who knows how long. Uh, so in, in essence, this, the book I, uh, I've written was, uh, it's 500,000 words. It's supposed to be for an entire course. So in this lecture, I've tried to condense as much as possible. Uh, and if I seem reductive, or I seem like I'm breezing over a lot of stuff, uh, it's because there was a little bit more there, but we can feel free to sort of ask questions about that. Um, but moving on, uh, I just wanted to say as well, uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of research projects uh, on Uber, international taxation, and, and technology over the last few years. And one question that has always sort of haunted me in doing these projects at the very, very end is, you know, what is the just, or what is a constitution of the just economy? Or to put it a different way, you know, what is a moral economy? And, and these kind of concepts seem sort of antagonistic and, and uh, you, know, you know, maybe they don't sort of work well together, I think, in, in this sort of mainstream discourse. So part of the attempt or, or part of what I'm trying to do here is to really unpack that and, and take a more pragmatic approach. And I think we've seen a lot of ideal theory and a lot of uh, ideal philosophy. Um, just before I begin, though, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, you know, sort of thank the Financial Times. Uh, this sort of started out as a, a book contest entry. I was only a finalist, but that was sort of the motivation for getting started. So for those of you who are younger, you know, you don't have to be in a PhD program in order to, to do some sort of scholarship and be curious. Uh, I encourage you to sort of do it. And, and also I wanted to say thanks to the editors at Rutledge and my, uh, my agent at Jane Cohen Nesbitt who have sort of pushed me to this point. So to begin, what's going on? I'd like to discuss something called the taxi cab problem, uh, which is really uh, about Uber, the, the ride hailing company. And I often ask myself the question, you know, what do you think Travis Kalanick, uh, the ex-CEO of Uber, is doing in his spare time these days? And I like to think he's probably reading some moral philosophy, or maybe just like you, attending a lecture on what I hope will be the new business ethics. But you know, I, I might I somehow doubt it as well. I think the news reports are that he's sort of starting a new startup. But I think this case is really interesting because if you'll recall, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those classic uh, meteoric rise and falls. Uh, he sort of began as this, uh, you know, the founder of, of Uber. He rapidly expanded it into 800, 814 cities in 88 countries, making the company, you know, what was once an amateur startup into something that's truly a global player. And all along, as, as, as has sort of come to be known, he had this philosophy of work which, let's just say, uh, was highly individualistic in nature. In the course of his rise, Uber's captured as much as 40% of on-demand short distance travel in cities like London, San Francisco, New York. Revenues in 2016 went from 6.5 billion to 220 billion the next year. And for supporters, the win at all cost uh, mantra, the win at all cost approach that Uber sort of epitomized is just another species of creative destruction, something that is you know, inherent in capitalism. Yet for critics like Ben Edelman at Harvard Business School, the win at all cost mantra is, is sort of not, you know, uh, predisposes a company to a Napster like fate, if anybody recalls they're out of business now uh, because of their legal issues. But it turns out that. Uh, Travis Kalanick's professional downfall had nothing to do with legal battles whatsoever. In fact, in February 2017, Susan Fowler, an ex Uber engineer, aired allegations of sexual misconduct, misogyny, and gender discrimination at Uber. And that was sort of the beginning of the end for him. 20 staff members were eventually let, let go. In what I like to call, and the Financial Times calls, Uber's Anna Cerebalis or Horrible Year. Uh, there was a video of Travis Kalanick caught on tape uh, being quite rude and sort of an angry tirade uh, with one of his cab drivers, or rather one of his, uh, I guess, employees, you could say. 
Uh, a few months later, I sort of put together a little timeline. Uh, under pressure from five investors, Travis took a leave of absence. The former Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, came in and wrote a report suggesting a wholesale adjustment in Uber's values as well as corporate governance. And so what I think is this really testifies to the democratic power of social media these days. And I think the Uber case is really a microcosm for what is going on in Silicon Valley more broadly. Think about, for example, Facebook's implication in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which if you follow the news, you'll know, you know, arguably thrust Trump into power and also resulted in the Brexit referendum. The Ashley Madison affair, the, uh, the sort of mistress website, I suppose you could say, uh, one of the largest data leaks in history. This is just to name a few. And I think these litany of improprieties, or this litany of improprieties, really should serve as a wake-up call, not just for managers, investors, and the sort of typical people you think about business, but also for us the users of these services. And it should, um, and, and also I think, you know, this litany of improprieties really highlights the failure of ethical theory itself, and in particular business ethics, to really address some of these issues, which are, you know, characterized so many different companies in the peer-to-peer sharing economy, or you could say the AI economy. And I think what this ultimately risks is, uh, you know, delegitimizing the modern corporation as an institution deserving public trust. So the question I ask is, how would existing theories address these issues? So we'll do a, a quick little tour through some of the, the existing theory. But before I do that, I just want to clarify some of my definitions, uh, which, you know, I, I might not define these the same way as a lot of other scholars. So ethics, I define as a form of private regulation. It derives from the word ethike in Greek, which means habit or customs, and it also combines the meaning from the Greek word adete, which refers to virtues of excellence, as well as, as ethos, which means character. Ethics will ask questions like, what is the right thing for me to do? Ethics concerns norms, what is permissible, what is impermissible, what is good or bad, what is valuable or not valuable, and are also our interpersonal values and social mores more generally. And ethics is something that is, exists uh, ex ante, uh, sort of before an action is taken, uh, in sort of an evaluative or decision-making guide, I suppose you'd say, but also something that is ex post, which means after the fact. So once you've done something, you learn from the consequences. So it's kind of a feedback loop in the way that I interpret it. <laughs> then there's my definition of law, which I see law as sort of the counterpart to ethics, insofar as it's a form of public regulation. Laws are promulgated by centralized authorities, often sovereigns, which, with the capability of enforcing the rules. Similar to ethics, it can be something ex ante, before something is done to deter, uh, through pre prescription or proscription. And similarly, ex post, after the fact, after something the deed is done, it can be used to enforce and punish. Corporate social responsibility, then, in my, in my view, describes the underlying moral theory of business situations, activities, and issues. And in my view, it can derive from many different sources, and it's pluralistic in nature. It can be consequential, uh, sort of in a utilitarian pro or rather a paradigm, something that's dutiful, uh, deontological perhaps, or something in plain language that is from the good, the just, the proposal, or the caring. And finally, business ethics, I think, is the pragmatic application of corporate social responsibility theory in everyday business practice. Normally, business ethics, according to Hansman, uh, who's really a, quite an illustrious scholar in this area, Normally, what we're talking about in business ethics is about ownership, management, employees, corporate governance, and strategic decisions. And really, the locus of the analysis is a focus on profits. And profits are described, in, in my view, in, in the literature, as the residual from a, a corporation's other contractual commitments, whether it's pay for employees, you know, interest owed on debts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So keep that profit concept in mind. So next, uh, here we have two of my favorite quotations. And I promise I'll get to the, 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 the two theories before, but this is uh, American pragmatist John Dewey, who's highly influential in my work. One of the quotations I have over here is, a problem well put is half solved. So I, I, I say this because we see a lot of diagnoses of the problems in the AI, sharing economy, et cetera, but very few people actually try to propose a solution or some sort of steps to follow to sort of uh, square the circle, if you will. So that's, with this project, and you know, who knows if I'll be successful in this talk, that's my ambition, diagnosis and resolution. And similarly, philosophy recovers itself when it ceases to be the device for dealing with the problems of philosophers and becomes the method cultivated by philosophers for dealing with the problems of men. So I think what this hints at is, you know, I'm not someone who's trying to be Immanuel Kant and do ideal theory. I'm not that smart. 
what I'm trying to do is create a problem-solving framework for everyday people and for society, uh, market, and state to really understand how to build and foster trust. So in, in so in so doing, I'll try to present or dig a little bit deeper into the Uber case. Uh, and what I just want to say is this is a very pragmatic approach. Uh, business as trust is. And it's cosmopolitan in the sense that it's focused on the concept of trust, which I'll elaborate on in a bit. So really quickly, uh, Maxim Storchyov provides us with a typology of different kinds of business ethics. There's normative business ethics, which is the principles of evaluating good and bad in business. Uh, is it good to take bribes as an example of a question you might ask? Positive business, business ethics, which concerns real behavior in situations of moral choice. Why do people in the real economy take bribes? If anyone's a fan of behavioral economics, I think you'll recognize it sort of belongs to this tradition. And finally, there's practical business ethics, which concerns instruments for motivating people to change their unethical behavior to an ethical one. How can we make people refrain from taking bribes? So my approach, and the approach of business is trust in the book, New Business Ethics, straddles the first, the normative business ethics, and the last, the practical business ethics. And what I seek to do is to sort of define the normative core of what business ethics is, uh, and then adopt a pragmatist moral epistemology that really looks at business ethics as a science of decision making, a theory and practice of value judgment, and also an ontology of market state relations that are organized in the dialectic. So here we go, the two theories of business ethics. On this side we have stockholder theory, and on that side we have stakeholder theory. First, let me say what I think unites them. The, the major assumption or the premise of both of these theories, I think, is, can be summed up in the concept of homo economicus. And essentially, hitherto, uh, okay, I'm going to mess that word up, but the dominant approaches have been really concerned uh, or take for granted this idea of a rational individual acting according to their self interest, their you know, venal self seeking. It's a very individualistic kind of frame. It's not very collectivist, and as I'll say later, it's not relational in nature. And I think these approaches also take for granted, and keep in mind their older approaches, they assume you know, there's a proper, properly functioning government, a government that has a capacity to redistribute. A, a government that has the capacity to enforce the rules of law. So the, to keep those assumptions in mind. Oh, and, and also a government that provides an effective welfare state. So the main premise of the stockholder theory uh, derives from Milton Friedman's work, uh, an article particularly in New York Times Magazine in, in 1970. And he said in that magazine, the social responsibility of business is to profit. So I sort of made a little bit of a diagram here. It's kind of a contractual nature. And essentially what he's proposing is that managers have a fiduciary duty, uh, which is a duty and equity at law, uh, to the stockholders or the owners to maximize profit. On the other side, we have something called the stakeholder theory, which was, so here's Milton Friedman, and then there's Edward Freeman, who came up with these, so I'll try to be uh, very particular with how I discuss the comparison, but um, essentially what Freeman argues is in fact, the you know, shareholders are not the only one with an interest in a firm, but rather, there's all these different groups with concurrent fiduciary, uh, or rather concurrent interest in the firm to which management has a fiduciary duty. So shareholders, government, competitors, customers, employees, civil society, suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. There's more variance and it gets more complex. So basically, uh, digging a little bit deeper, what Friedman in the stockholder theory sees is, you know, they posit that the firm merely exists to facilitate the transfer of capital and to generate returns for investors. And the core of this theory is something called the principal agent relationship, as I sort of foregrounded. And essentially, the, the only relationship is between management and the others, and the only discretion management can exercise is to pursue profit, so long as they're honest and not deceptive. In their sort of ontolo <clears throat> ontology, the corporation is merely a set of contractual relationships. The only requirement on management beyond profit seeking is to obey the law and not engage in deception. <clears throat> and corporate social responsibility in this frame is perceived as an unfair tax on, on shareholders. This is, of course, the dominant approach today. Uh, it really traces back, at least at law, to Dodge versus Ford Motor Company 1919, in which the court says a business organization is carried out primarily for the profit of the stockholders. So it, it is a matter of law. From the utilitarian perspective, uh, utilitarianism, as I'll talk about later, is an ethics based on the consequences of your action. There are really three elements in my view. First, when considering an action, management must just decide, is this illegal? Second, management must determine, does it contravene our morals or social mores? And third, they must execute the action so long as it is not a contravention of one or two. Then we have deontology, uh, which is an ethics of duty. In deontology, there's essentially, uh, well, two components here. That's a little bit more confusing, I think, but 
there's a presumptive, uh, uh, you know, presumptive duty to maximize shareholder profit. And beyond that, uh, there's this notion of an imperfect duty of beneficence. So essentially, you know, if the corporation has a formalized code of conduct, et cetera, et cetera, it's important to ensure that they observe that code of conduct while pursuing profit. Uh, what are some of the critiques to this approach? Well, a few. Uh, there's the humanist critique, uh, which basically says that, especially the utilitarian version of the stockholder theory, but what, what we're really talking about here is the pursuit of lower order goods, whereas we ignore the higher order moral goods, belief systems, and core values that characterize a lot of other philosophy traditions. Uh, the second one, uh, advanced by Joseph Heath, who used to be the director of the center, actually, is the market failures approach, in which Heath says, you know, Friedman, in coming up with this theory, was thinking of capitalism as a whole, whereas if we really look at the operation of the price mechanism, what matters the most is that we pursue Pareto optimum or optimal outcomes. So Pareto optimal means, in the sort of normative sense, is in doing something, we want to make some better off without making other, others wor worse off. That's sort of the crux of it. Um, and so what Heath argues is that what, what we really need to be talking about is the Pareto standard of efficiency, using the price mechanism to clear goods at the lowest possible price, the highest possible quality, and there's an essentially a prohibition on waste. And the third critique I'll raise is, again, stockholder theory kind of takes the state for granted. It's just somewhere in the background, you know, they just assume it functions properly. A stakeholder theory, what we see, I've, I guess I repeat myself a little bit, but there are concurrent interests in the firm that are not just about shareholders, and there's what we call a multi-fiduciary uh, within, within the firm. So you have to evaluate the stakes of different groups. That, that's management's job, you know, suppliers, competitors, government, etc. They're all part of the mix. Ontologically speaking, the stakeholder theory sees the firm as a value-creating you know, uh, phenomenon, or I, I guess a social form of some kind. Um, utilitarianism as applied in stakeholder theory, the first thing management must do is assess the threats, the costs, and execute accordingly. From the deontological perspective, which I think is the main one usually used to justify it, there's a few aspects. Management must consider all stakeholders who are affected by a certain policy or procedure, they must not solely consider one stakeholder. They must not, uh, you know, decide, uh, you know, uh, things on the basis of a simple majority vote or who has more of a say. Principles in the corporation must be universalizable and not violate basic respect and dignity of persons. And also, similarly, there is an imperfect duty of beneficence. So, really quickly going through the critiques, uh, Heath argues that fiduciary is a con contrastive term, meaning you can only be a fiduciary to one, not others. I actually disagree, as I'll explain later. Uh, if you think about a, a, a corporation, there's active investors, passive investors, controlling investors, not controlling investors, at law, and I think in ethics, fiduciary duties can be expanded to multiple groups. Second critique, it's really hard to distinguish competing claims of groups in an effective way. You have competitors who are mad at you for taking their business. You have employees who want more money. You have owners who want more dividends. How do you choose? It's really difficult. Um, also, we know there are winners and losers in business, despite the Pareto optimal sort of normative core. And also, I think this approach doesn't really talk a lot about the process of decision making. So let's quickly revisit some of the more uh, trenchant or aspects of the Uber case study. So I believe this quotation was taken from 2015, sort of as Uber's ramping up, uh, they've expanded the UberX platform into a lot of US cities. And so the WSJ, you know, a lot of regulators have started going after Uber. They sort of go into the city, break the rules, they don't care. They say, you know, do you ever cease? Travis Kalanick, no. Do you ever desist? Desist. Kalanick says no. So you basically just ignored them, that being the regulators. Kalanick says, the thing is, a cease and desist is something that says, hey, I think you should stop. And we're saying, we don't think we should. So what would stockholder theory, that stockholder theory say? Well, first, I think stockholder theory would say, prima facie, this violates the prohibition on illegality, because what Uber's strategy amounts to is essentially a form of arbitrage. You, you play by your set of rules, taxi cab companies, and we'll play by our own. And the second one, and this is arguable, you know, perhaps this kind of philosophy or strategy violates you know, social mores more generally, but we need more information to decide that. Uh, the stakeholder theory, I said, or rather would say, you know, this doesn't really address or assess the interests of uh, other stakeholders uh, by the duty beneficent, you know, perhaps competitors would care. Um, and also, with the win at any cost mantra, I mean, we talked about the utilitarian variant of stakeholder theory, but in assessing the cost, maybe in the longer term, it's a good thing that, uh, you know, 
that they've done this because now they've done an IPO and they're going to be rich one day, maybe. But in the shorter term, there are uh, significant costs from regulatory fines, et cetera. So it's an open question. Next, here we have Uber's pre-IPO company values. Uh, I'll let you read them yourself so they don't go on too long. One of my favorite is super pumped. I really couldn't decide what it means, or I couldn't find out what it means, but I quite like that one. Um, you know, and this is a paradigmatic uh, sort of case of uh, Uber's uh, rather silly value, sort of values, but what would stockholder theory say? Hmm, perhaps, you know, none of this may be objectionable, you know, who knows. Uh, but what we can certainly see in meritocracy and toe-stepping is this sort of uh, idea of individualism really coming through and ignoring sort of higher beliefs and values that characterize other traditions. Uh, number two, principled confrontation. I think this speaks to a theme in the first one and suggests a willingness to break the law and presume institutional change without any kind of democratic participation. So I think that can be problematic as well. Stakeholder theory, you know, I think it's difficult to interpret, you know, how you weigh competing claims between groups. But if you think about Susan Fowler and a lot of women in tech, et cetera, et cetera, you know, they might, uh, you know, might have other beliefs about what sort of value should be professed versus, you know, meritocracy and toe setting, which I think was sort of instrumental in her complaint, or central to, rather. Um, really quickly, Uber's pre-IPO capital structure. So prior to the IPO, Uber had something called the dual class share structure. And what this does is this decouples within a security economic rights to dividends and profits, et cetera, versus governance rights. So what that means, uh, when Uber went public, or rather before they went public, there was something called Class B common stock shares, and then there were preferred shares. Class B, or super shares, which is what Travis Kalanick had, had a 10 to 1 voting, uh, or rather voting power on the board, versus preferred shares, which had other privileges but not the same kind of rights. Uh, and just to give you sort of an, an example of this, there's an 11 person board on Uber at the time, Kalanick, in, ad in addition to being the founder and CEO and owning all these super shares, had the power to control three of the 11. So, stockholder theory, what would this say? Well, stockholder theory does a bad job distinguishing between active and passive investors or controlling and not controlling investors. And I think, and I'm, I'm still sort of thinking through this puzzle, but in the case of dual class share structures, and especially the sort of uh, kind of firm that you see in Silicon Valley, when you have an owner who's the founder and who's completely in control of the corporation, it sort of eviscerates, I think, this relational logic undermining it, or rather underlying fiduciary duty. Because I think what the fiduciary duty suggests in corporate governance is that if you have a relationship with someone who's not you, that will act on a constraint on your behavior, so you act in accordance with their interests. But if you're both the owner and the manager, you know, is it just a duty to yourself? Does that make a lot of sense and withstand the kind of logic underlying it? I'm not sure. I don't think so, though. Stakeholder theory. Uh, I think, well, it's very obvious here that, you know, there's no equal treatment between two different groups. That would offend, I guess, some of the tenets, depending on which ethical tradition you apply. You know, one class certainly has more advantages over the other, and it's very anti-democratic in nature. Uh, really quickly, I'll try to go through the multi-sided business structure. So we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, assuming we have time, but essentially what platforms act as are intermediaries between different sides of the market. So in Uber's case, on side one, you'd have people looking for ride hailing services. Side two, you'd have uh, people providing ride hailing services. Side three, if you've done Uber Eats, you know, restaurants uh, might be on side three selling people food. And the basic model of this business is that in the middle, the, the people who own the platform take a cut. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail, but again, you know, just looking at it very generally, what might stockholder theory say? Well. I'm not sure stockholder theory was built for this era of a post-managerial firm. I'm not sure it has a lot to say about this. Stakeholder theory, on the other hand, there's certainly lots of stakeholders implicated here. Again, how do we distinguish, distinguish between their claims and for what reasons? Really quickly, uh, Uber's driver partner contract. Another example, or another one of my favorites. What we have here uh, is, you know, in, instead of uh, being a conventional employee just like everyone else, uh, Uber's uh, driver partners are independent contractors. Instead of Uber, be Uber being a uh, brokerage of taxis like anybody else would be, they're a technology company. And instead of, uh, instead of, well, hold on. And, and, and yeah, so basically what the, the way that these contracts are framed is you're subscribing or seeking to get leads from Uber service and it's, it's really a lead generation thing. So I ask, you know, is this a sleight of hand? Uh, Stockholder theory, you know, the firm is in excess of contracts, maybe this is such a big deal. 
Uh, is it illegal? Uh, perhaps, actually, uh, TBD or rather to be determined. Um, and I think uh, stockholder theory might take you know issue with the fact or the the issue of rather market power because obviously this kind of contract. Um, you know, it's contrary to the way that you know normal contract or normal business relationship would be organized in the taxi cab market, for example. So, what we see here is this. You know, in this legal language, is is we're really pr privileging this kind of ideal form of you know what the company wants it to be versus the actual substance, especially in, in comparison with the way that actual or the established markets work that they're disrupting. Um, Again, you know, stakeholder theory might say, well, you know, are you thinking about the competition? You know, perhaps it's unfair that there's one set of rules for them, one set of rules for you, et cetera. Um, I just, I'll breeze through this really quickly, but this is a judicial opinion in 2015 uh, in the case of Steve Toronto versus Uber, where the judge referred to the, the Uber as a supercharged directory assistance service. So it looks like the courts are typically taking the side of companies and going form over substance, not the reverse. Uh, one final piece, which is one of my pet topics as well, is uh, Uber's international taxation structure. So if you look over here, there's an Uber driver right over there. When they collect a fare, 100% of it goes to Uber BV in the Netherlands. Check your receipts next time. Uh, you'll notice that they are Netherlands based. They take 1% of the cut as income. Then Racer Operations BV, also in the Netherlands, processes the payments, sends 80% back to the drivers. What happens here? Uber EV then sends money to the local subsidiaries. I said 88 countries, but this is maybe dated at 60 here. They fund their marketing and support services over there. They also send a cut to Uber International CV, which is incorporated in the Netherlands and incorporated in Bermuda. They're not, the income here is not taxed at all by the United States uh, and many of the local governments where they, uh, rather the, lo the local localities where they are. And then what they do is they send 1.45% of net revenues paid as royalty for the IP rights to Uber Technologies, which is located in San Francisco. Main point really is they're not really paying their taxes, and this is paradigmatic for a lot of digital corporations. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about how the different theories would look at it, but essentially what we have is a familiar theme, the official legal form versus the actual substance. So the question I want to leave you with is, are the economic activities as they're sort of portrayed on paper really align with the reality on the ground. Hmm, we'll see. So essentially, the core critique that I have of the two, so the two theories, which I breeze through, is their vague, abstract, and determined practice and have little relevance to the myriad of ethical risks we need to redress today. They're overly focused on corporate hierarchies and the reality is we live in a world uh, increasingly governed by networks. They mistakenly assume the nation state is effective power and authority in, global in the age of globalization 4.0, which is not the case. They do not conceive of ethics and law in terms of public and private regulation, which I think is problematic. They're sort of sequestered into their own worlds. Uh, both of these theories are governed by mythology of the individual. They're hamstrung by the ends means binary. And they tend to ignore gender, racial, and sexual identity inequities, and also the relevance of human culture. So the question I ask here and in my book is, why and how must we reimagine the normative and practical foundations of corporate social responsibility and the practice of business ethics so as to minimize ethical risk and redress social inequities resulting from the technology economy? So the premise, I'm sorry. The premise, as I advertise in the, in the event right, is that in order to be responsive uh, to this new world of business, we really need to think of business ethics and CSR as a practical process of decision-making and accountability that exists to foster and maintain trust in enterprise. We need to think of it as a uh, form of market society relations, which is composed of uh, multiple institutional spheres of action, which are both distinct but interconnected and dynamic and relational in nature. I think we need to uh, orient the new business eth ethics towards advancing a new discourse ethics and a new universal pragmatics, which pragmatic, which is pluralistic in nature, and circumscribes both the normativities of law and social order, uh, as well as concepts or ethical concepts, right, good, just, obligatory, obligatory caring, proposive. I think in, in this uh, market society relation uh, idea, we need to think of it as both a top-down <coughs> process from within the corporation to society at large, as well as a bottom-up process that's actor-centric in nature. And I think ultimately what we need to do is reconceive the new business ethics as a new social constitution of the digital economy grounded in the principles of responsibility of capital, transparency mandated by the state, and accountability enforced by society. 
it's not really wordy. Uh, so what I'll just say quickly, I, I did touch on this earlier, but uh, this is Plato and Aristotle who argue a lot about uh, substance and form. Um, in this, I, I do have legal training, I guess, uh, as my last degree, but I think law and ethics are, you know, we sh they shouldn't take each other for granted. They shouldn't be artificially demarcated from each other. I think what they are are mutually constituted in nature. Uh, it, if you look at, for example, uh, Supreme Court rulings, in law school I thought the judges were super, super smart, like, wow, have you come up with all these crazy cool tests? Turns out it's philosophy in action. And I think ethics would do a lot to benefit from looking at how the law adjudicates things as well. Because again, I conceptualize law and ethics as private and public forms of regulation, which sort of uh, relate to Friedrich Hayek's uh, distinction between cosmos and taxis uh, orders, or sort of emergent or established orders, uh, centrally established. Um, sorry, one more thing. Uh, yeah, so I, I discussed the fact that they're a conceptual continuum, and I think that we need to really think about context and facts instead of ideal theory. And as it stands, uh, ideal theory tends to dominate the intellectual landscape. So this is kind of my, my little model, which I stole from Luciano Floridi. But you kind of have this reciprocal determination. You know, society you know, determines what ethics are through sort of morality, or rather uh, morality is publicity, which I'll get into, which feeds into law, uh, which I guess concretizes these normative conceptions which fashions the way that businesses run and the sort of compliance activities they have to undertake, which then affects the way that customers are dealt with and sort of their sort of reciprocal feedback loop in this manner. So what is business as trust? Finally, the actual thesis I'm talking about. Um, so here we have Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and excuse my French, but in 2008, I think he was still an undergrad at Harvard, or you know, perhaps he just dropped out, but here's a text message conversation between him. Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, so if you ever need info about anyone at Harvard, just ask. I have over 4,000 emails, pictures, addresses, SMS, redacted names, name, friend's name. What? How'd you manage that one? Zuckerberg, people just submitted it. I don't know why. They trust me, dumb fools. <laughs> and then on the other side, uh, we'll all know what happened to Cambridge Analytica. 2017, Mark Zuckerberg in a blog post. This was a breach of trust between Alexander Hogan, Cambridge Analytica, and Facebook, but was also a breach of trust between Facebook and the people who share their data with us and expect us to protect it. We need to fix that. So my conceptualization of trust is certainly not this one. It's more so this one in trying to explore what that <laughs> breach of public trust really means. So what is business trust? The purpose of business trust is to embed the logic of data privacy security and, equ or and equitable algorithmic management in a coherent theory of corporate social responsibility, which is then applied in business ethics and business practice. Uh, what it really is concerned with, and this was hinted at in the question, is, is thinking about CSR, corporate social responsibility and business ethics, as ex ante from the corporate perspective is a means of minimizing ethical risks, such as we've seen in all of these scandals in Silicon Valley, but also ex post from a governmental and societal perspective as a means of redressing the inequities resulting from the technology economy. So business as trust, trust has two parallel conceptions. And I'll say, I mean, this is kind of trending, uh, Jack Balkan is one of the major uh, architects of this new concept of trust, but trust on the one hand refers to social capital. It refers to our expectation that others will behave according to certain norms. It's about reasonable expectation. And fostering and maintaining trust is thus essential for minimizing ethical, ethical risks within the business at the micro level. And at the macro level, it's essential for a property, rather a properly functioning market economy. It is, in a sense, the glue that holds society, state, and market together. And from the cosmopolitan perspective, uh, we, businesses need to create and maintain trustworthiness in order to be good corporate citizens and in order to have uh, trustworthy relationships with their customers. So that's, I guess, trust and social capital is one branch of my definition. But trust, because I am drawing on law and equity as well, also means something in terms of proprietary relations. Uh, in large publicly traded tech companies, for example, this concept of trust uh, conceives of them as special purpose sovereigns, which is something that I, I share with Jack Balkin at the law school and areas of law, et cetera, et cetera. And the premise here is that Property rights never have been absolute, going back to when the first corporations were established in like 1555 in England. Rather, there, you know, property rights have never been absolute. In addition to 
creating profits for investors, they've been enacted and created in order to pay taxes and to sort of facilitate the state as an economic actor. And essentially, the, mas the basic premise of this pro proprietary conception is, is the notion that managers hold, others rather hold other people's property in trust in the interest of the people that either create the property or own it. And that essentially, uh, this, this isn't a relation strictly to controlling shareholders or people who are, you know, who are dominant within the corporation, but rather it's holding powers and trust for all people who have some kind of pecuniary or ownership interest in the firm itself. And it's this concept of trust and this non-contrastive idea that I analogize uh, the duty to two new groups and articulate two new groups of uh, stakeholders. So as I, as I mentioned, I, I disagree with Joseph Heath, who's the director here, He's a, or was the old director in uh, advanced market failures approach. Because what I argue, uh, in accordance with Adolf Burl's uh, Corporation of Private Property, 1933, is that uh, the, the sort of trusting relationship between ownership, uh, rather management and owners, uh, is a lot more complex and, and nuanced in nature rather than just being to one group exclusively. And so in redefining two new stakeholder groups, what I really want to focus on is this conception of profit and the interest in profit itself. So the first new group that I, I've come up with, uh, and it's I guess one of the major thrusts of my theory, is this idea of a data citizen as stakeholder. So hear me out. Typically, when you sign up for Google or you sign up for Facebook, the, the basic bargain is I get free services in exchange for my data. So this is a conception, uh, as Eric Posner and Elon Weil argue, uh, is a conception of data as capital. So you give away your data, your data, you know, per out of Smith's time and water paradox, not worth a lot to you, but when a company gets lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of data, it's a gold mine. They can aggregate the information, analyze it, sell it to advertisers, look how successful all these companies are. Instead, I argue this idea of data as capital is completely wrong. And what we need to do is flip the table and adopt a conception of data as labor, of, in accordance with Elon Weil and Richard, or rather Eric Posner, who are kind enough to send me their book. Uh, so I will cite them. And essentially what this argues, following a Lockean theory of private property, and Locke is of course the one who said that if you, you know, you can, you know, sort of sequester private property from the public domain by mixing your labor with it. What I argue is that by creating data ourselves, we have an unrecognized proprietary interest in that data. And it's only through, and it's, it's only because of the inequality of bargaining power between us as individual citizens and also the inequality of the value of the data as an aggregate and individually, that this data as capital conception reigns. And I think we need to really think about, uh, you know, essentially if we create data, each of us individually, have some kind of interest in profit, just like normal owners in a corporation. So that's why I argue that we need to think of data citizens as, as stakeholders in the same way as we think of owners because of the profit function. Uh, and that's how, uh, yeah, so that's number one. And number two, the second stakeholder group that I really want to clarify in, in a really sort of, you know, liberal private property uh, conception is this idea of taxpayer as stakeholder. Why? Well, as I mentioned, the first corporations were chartered to not only profit for investors, but also to provide taxes for the state, which are, you know, are supposed to be redistributed. And so I argue that living in an environment where Google, Starbucks, uh, Apple, like a lot of these companies pay effectively no taxes, that taxpayers are entitled to a share nominally of, of these companies' profits, and therefore taxpayers also have a pecuniary or economic interest in profits as well. So this is something that's, you know, I think wholly consistent with what Milton Friedman would argue or the classical or neoclassical conventional business ethics approaches. And an added aspect of this is taxation isn't just what you and I pay and what we are entitled to as you know, citizens of a, a nation state. We can also think of regulation as a form of taxation. You know, if you're a, if a taxi company that plays by the rules versus Uber who doesn't in this case study, you effectively pay a tax for being regulated. You know, you're, you have to charge more money, you can earn less profit, et cetera, et cetera. So this concept of taxpayer as stakeholder, in addition to data citizen, data citizen as stakeholder, opens the doors to the inclusion of uh, a lot more groups such as competitors, et cetera, et cetera, within this conception or this new concept of the corporation that I'm trying to advance. Um, okay, so that's the first part. And the second part is, and don't get scared, I know a lot of people hate Milton Friedman, but 
I want to actually restate his theory. Uh, and and I, I will argue I was a bit reductive earlier on purpose. So version one, and this is the version you hear all the, th all the time, is the social responsibility of business is to profit. A lot of business ethicists will just take this and run with it, but they're wrong. What Friedman actually says is that the social responsibility of business is to profit. However, in version two, or I guess lower down in the article in, in the rest of the scholarship, he argues that a corporate executive is an employee of the owners of the business and has a direct responsibility to them, and that the responsibility of, of these executives and the management is to conduct business in accordance with their desires, which will be to make as money generally to be to make as much money as possible while conforming to the basic rules of society, both those embodied in law and those embodied in ethical custom. So I think at this point, or at this stage in the analysis, you know, a lot of the business ethics debates today are mistaken for want of a more rigorous reading of Friedman's theory and a more rigorous conception of the interest in profit making, which I've discussed. And essentially, what I argue is that the problem, or what's left unsaid with Friedman's theory, is it takes for granted the fact that you know whether the state can effectively enforce the rules of the game in the context of globalization. And I argue, you know, based on the fact that corporations you know take as as much as five hundred billion dollars a year from the Atlantic economies, that this is no longer the case. Sort of this uh, this Weberian notion that you know states can administer and regulate their economies and you know in ways such as taxation, redistribution, provision for the welfare state, that's a flawed assumption. Thus, I argue in the technology economy today, we really live in a polycentric order, which is governed by a mix of public and private forms of regulation. And that in this context, the social responsibility of the firm is to profit, subject to the basic rules of society embodied in law and ethical custom. That business must exercise good faith in accordance with the, informal or the internal principles of efficiency, fairness, and equity, which correspond with macro level or overarching uh, principles of responsibility, transparency, and accountability, as I'll explain. Um, and that essentially, in the absence of effective state regulation, where the state is unwilling or unable to regulate in a conventional kind of way, it becomes, it becomes incumbent upon states to further their cooperation with one another in an attempt to regulate. But more importantly, it's incumbent upon society itself to enforce the terms of the equitable social contract of the firm, which is, again, premised on those uh, basic principles of efficiency, as I'll later define, fairness and equity. Um, all right, let's speed along here, because I'm going too slow. Um, so essentially, what we have here, it's a, it's a complicated diagram, but I, I essentially argue that there's seven rules or seven elements within these broader basic principles of responsibility, transparency, accountability, uh, you can read them for yourselves, codification, chasm street, institution, transaction, execution are internal to the firm itself. These are steps that we must go through from the, you know, dis, you know, deciding what our values are, analyzing cases, you know, balancing the factors. I, I developed a test for this within the firm in its sort of constitution itself, uh, evaluating transactions and executing them. I argue the state's role is here, transparency, function, and governance, and finally, the constitution of the new social contract of the uh, economy is incumbent upon communicators and these stakeholder groups that I've identified. So what, you know, the basic premises here, I, I'll try to emphasize, are this focus on value judgment. Instead of uh, a ends means binary, sort of a reciprocal determination of ends and means, if you look at, there's a time scale here, you know, within the firm, maybe there could be some learning from the ethical, you know, sort of traditions, maybe not. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's the state sort of intervention that forces some kind of learning exercise, or finally, it's the, or rather, it's society that for, forces corporations to change themselves. Um, so at its core, I think what I try to do in the book is to clarify the new social responsibilities of the corporation based on this historic relationship between trust law and ethics. I view equity, which is a, a form of law, as a, basically a manifestation of ethics. And also to articulate new duties owned by the modern firm to their end users and point to how we can restore trust in the economy in the age of digital stateless markets. So the road ahead. I'll have to go a little bit faster, but not too much. Uh, essentially, uh, going back to my question, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about why. What is business? What is the old world of business? I have five stylized ways of thinking about forms or social forms of human exchange. What is the new world of business? What are the main issues? I'm going to breeze through what ethics is. We've already talked a lot about business ethics. And then I'll try to get into some of the aspects of the theory itself and then apply them in the cases if we get lucky at the very end. Why? That's where we are right now. So what is business? 
Um, consider the etymology to begin with. In Old English, busyness meant care, anxiety, or occupation, deriving from the root word busy, which was defined as careful, anxious, busy, or diligent. By the mid-14th century, the original meaning had evolved. Busyness became busyness, which meant the state of being much occupied or engaged. In the 17th century, busyness was pronounced with two syllables, similar to current parlance. By the mid-18th century, business beca busyness became business in its formal use. According to the Oxford Dictionary, business is a mass noun that has many meanings, so that doesn't really clarify what we're looking for. In purely a commercial terms, business can refer, for example, to a person's regular occupation, profession, or trade. The idea of business itself traces back to antiquity. It was Aristotle who founded most of the disciplines I'm, I'm interested in, just generally, uh, he laid down the conceptual foundations for the idea of business in the discipline of economics when he was lecturing at the Lyceum. And what the ancient philosopher basically argued is that there's two intentions or there's two aspects to economics as a discipline. The first one is what we called, uh, it's basically uh, consisted of the habits and practices of the household, or oikos, uh, which is an interesting kind of word. And then the second and ancillary aspect was really this money-making function of trade outside the family, or what I'll butcher this, but it's called premis titipie. Uh, so what really Aristotle did is he, he thought about business as humanistic first and profit-making second, which is something I think has been lost in sort of modern, uh, the modern discipline. What was essential for uh, expanding you know, human exchange outside of the household? It was currency, according to Aristotle, and politics. He writes, once a currency had been provided, out of necessary exchange, the other type of skill in acquiring goods arose, er, goods arose, trade. And what essentially is happening here, I think, is you know, Aristotle, of course, writing before the modern division of labor, et cetera, et cetera. But what he's really criticizing is the unrestricted profit motive. For he saw the profit motive as limitless in nature, whereas within social contexts, such as the household, it was restrained effectively by relationships, rather than being something that's purely relational. So for those who are uh, fans of Karl Polanyi, who wrote The Greatest Transformation, he argues, and he's very, very big in the literature and political science at least, is this is probably the most prophetic point, uh, pointer ever made in the realm of the social sciences, being the best analysis of the subject we possess, despite it you know, being an antiquity. So I've talked about the humanism aspect. Um, so now we move to Adam Smith. Adam Smith, I think, is very famous for the quotation. Uh, keep in mind, Adam Smith was both a moral philosopher, uh, he wrote Theory of Moral Sentiments first, and also an economist, uh, he wrote The Wealth of Nations second. He saw these sort of realms as artificially demarcated from each other. So here's an example. In The Wealth of Nations, Smith writes, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewers, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Whereas, interestingly, in TMS, or Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, Smith says, how, so elfish, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. So what we know, I think, you know, in economics is Smith's main contribution is this idea that the economy is run, or rather is predicated on a, you know, rational individualistic self-interest. And it's directed, of course, by an invisible hand uh, which serves the greater good as a whole, sort of this divine conception. Smith thought that you know, markets were essentially about voluntary exchange. At the macro foundational level, voluntary tra uh, transactions between two individuals were really part of a contract. Um, and essentially, uh, sorry. Um, uh, so yeah, and, yeah, contracting is really, uh, voluntary exchange is, is very central. And essentially, uh, what Smith envisioned, I think, is in contracting, in voluntary exchange, two persons pursue their self-interest independently of one another. And in specifying, or in they specify their goals to engage in trade in a very sort of a impersonal way, and often will you know, sell to the highest price or the highest bidder, in which identity is no concern. But what we know about this conception of the economy and what's very relevant to remain in globalization 2.0 is that despite you know, this idea of this free market and this voluntary world, often self-enforcement of contracts is not possible. Richard Posner makes this point in 1992. And indeed, in Smith, in Theory of Moral Sentiments, he tells us, commerce and manufacturers can seldom flourish long in any state which does not enjoy a regular administration of justice. So what does that say, I guess, to the globalization 4.0 today? Um, some of the critiques, I mean, the Smithian 
view of economics is quite dominant. Uh, obviously, the idealized economy differs from the actual economy. Not all, not all social interactions are exchange-based and can be commodified. Um, Jean Tirole, the Nobel Prize laureate, tells us, of course, markets can harm social cohesion. And Michael Sandel from Harvard, uh, in What Money Can't Buy, tells us that money can't buy everything, can't buy friendship. Um, a few other aspects since Smith developed the concept of economics. Uh, of course, market power and the marginal revolution because of the ingen ingenio economies, such as Leon Walras, uh, Antoine Cournot, and Jules Dupuis, who essentially looked at the market power held by monopolies. And a sort of uh, related concept is this idea of monopsony, which really applies to the uh, sharing economy or AI economy today, in which buyers have a monopoly over the terms and conditions uh, in which they buy or collect information. So again, think, Google, free services in exchange for your data. There's an example of mono monopsony. And just like monopoly, monopsony can have negative effects uh, socially and economically. So really quickly, uh, I have conceptualized uh, the development of the economy in terms of the modalities of exchange of property, broadly defined, uh, in a highly stylized way. So I'm not a historian, don't, don't beat me up if you are. Initially, I think, we, what we really had is this idea of oikos, or non-pecuniary economic relationships. You know, for as long as humankind has existed, you know, hunter-gatherers have always had to find food, share it among their families, within relationships of, uh, you know, familiar relationships or within relationships of kinship. Next, we have the development of economic communities. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Then emerges the idea of an individual as an economic agent themselves, really the crux of liberalism. The development of corporations as economic persons. And finally, the development of multi-sided platforms. And really, the main points here are, in the first four, four dimensions or parts of this evolution, the state has ordinarily played the vital constitutive function, constitutive function in fostering and maintaining trust in business. I'll give some examples in a moment. And I think in this revolutionary moment, we can see, especially when we're talking about digital economy firms, this is no longer the case. For the state has been unable to keep pace and regulate in accordance with the traditional rule. Often these companies observe minimum legal obligations and flood the spirit of the law, and the multi-sided business model collapses, I think, what I you know, think are these traditional distinctions between uh, different forms of exchange, uh, or, or we can define it maybe as in terms of autarky, sy symmetry, and centralization. Uh, so moving ahead, uh, essentially non-pecuniary economic relationships uh, one great example of this comes from Carl Polanyi's work on the Trobriand Islanders. Uh, Polanyi criticized Adam Smith because he said, you know, Smith kind of, uh, you know, didn't really look at primitive economies, uh, wrote them off because he was colored by prejudice. And what he found on the Trobriand Islanders, or islands rather, in this archipelago, is you had an entire economic system that was based on social prestige and the exchange of gifts. So what he says, you know, because ultimately Smith uh, traces the development of economics to uh, you know human a human capacity or a, a basic human or human nature really it's it, you know it's a propensity that we have to truck and barter and Polanyi says you know here's here's evidence that it's not just about the individual entering into contracts but rather that the economy itself is submerged in social relationships so what what uh, drove the change again I talked about this but it was really the development of money and currency. Uh, that, that changed, uh, or rather, that forced this first evolution. Uh, you know, talking or, or looking at antiquity, there's one theory, uh, or Richard Seifert says that, you know, that Polanyi or Aristotle would argue, well, the development of money disembedded the economy from ordinary social relations. But, on the other hand, what we see is that money derived value in antiquity, and until today, you could argue, from its fiduciary, or sort of the government stamp or seal uh, on the coin itself. Uh, so, you know, we need to think about, uh, again, trust and how the state has historically, uh, you know, played a constitutive function in fostering and maintaining trust. Next, communities of exchange. I will breeze through this one because it's almost an hour now, but essentially the Oxford Dictionary talks about business in another concept, uh, or another way, rather, as trade and all activity relating to it, involving the community as a whole. I talk a lot about trust, uh, interesting stories. So, uh, essentially, you know, fifth, from the 5th to 14th century, Britain was dominated by a system of feudalism, which was a political edifice built over the ruins of the Roman Empire. And in essence, the king sat sort of the apex of the social order and held what is known as lodial rights. So he owned all the land. Yet, there were landowners, I guess, in a sense, 
who held uh, legal title to the land, and you know they, they were not the equitable owners per se, or rather, I mean they, they didn't actually own the land. It was really, you know, further to the king, uh, the kings, I guess, sort of granting them land itself. But during the Crusades, and, and so in order to exercise your right over the land as a, as a uh, in, in this time, you you had to be there. And so what happened is this class of English land, landowners during the Crusades in 1095 CE were called to go to the Holy Land, and essentially they ran into this problem. Because if they left, they wouldn't be able to get their land back, yet the Pope was forcing them to go fight. So essentially what happened is, is while uh, during the Crusades these people would entrust their land to someone else, like a neighbor or whatever, go off and fight. And what, what would happen is they'd come back and the people they'd entrusted with the land would be like, sorry, it's not yours anymore, it's mine now. And so what ended up happening is, uh, you know, they'd go petition the king, and what the king of England did is he created something called uh, the, 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 rather, the court of chancellery. And here we find the development of the concept of trust as a legal term. And essentially, the lord chancellor, you have, you know, in law, the king owned all the land, these people had no rights to it. He developed something called equity. And it's this concept of equity, which is, in my view, you know, the chancellor was like a you know member of the church. It's the application of ethics and morals to law itself as sort of a supplement to it. So that's really important. Um, and, and I think you know here we have kind of the origins of private property as we know it. Doctrines of equity uh, influence tax, corporate law, commercial law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in this period as well, you know, the development of medieval guilds and trade unions, uh, merchant guilds, or you know, emerged in the Dark Ages and ultimately developed into you know professional associations in London. Uh, and also the development of credit and debt helped, you know, transform the economy uh, from a community of exchange into something bigger. Uh, the individual as an economic agent, again, the, this is really about the story about li liberalism. Freedom of contract is obviously a central aspect of this. Uh, in the 17th century England, uh, the development of laissez-faire uh, economics, which was really, I guess, the decisive moment was the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. Um, that's an important aspect as well. Essentially, I think in the, this notion that the individual is not an economic agent, you have this assumption in contracting that there is an equality of bar bargaining power. Back then, uh, you know, in the 1800s, 1900s, etc., or even, even before, jurisprudence showed that was not the case. It was often capital that would win over labor. Um, and in, in, this, in this sort of era, I know I'm breezing through this, but you also have the development of the regulation professions. So moving forward, the next major development is the emergence of the corporation as an economic person. Uh, Oxford Dictionary, again, talks about firms within its conception of business. Uh, according to Henry Hotzman, what is a corporation? A uh, business corporation is just a particular type of cooperative in which ownership is assigned to a group of the firm's patrons and the person and people in capital, the firm, et cetera, et cetera. The first corporations emerged in 1555 with the joint stock companies in England. Um, there was then passed the Corporations Registration Act in 1844, the Limited Liability Act, Joint Stock, Stock Companies Act in 1856, which established, you know, responding to the needs uh, to essentially uh, to, to, to minimize risk in investment. Uh, you know, the British Parliament had legislated to create sort of these protections for the corporation, but it wasn't really until uh, the case of Solomon, which the modern doctrine of legal personality took effect. What happened, though? Um, I think there's a decisive shift from the way that business was organized uh, in the 19th century to the 20th century. Ordinarily, uh, ownership of the firm and uh, control were sort of fused into one, you know, something called proprietary capitalism. You think of the mom and pop shop, you know, that was kind of what corporate law was really intended to serve, its, uh, or in intended to protect. And then what we have is this emergence of managerial capitalism. Managerial capitalism, I think, what the essence of managerial capitalism is this sort of uh, separation of ownership and control. And that's, I guess, the modern paradigm that we live in. Uh, again, you know, managerial capitalism uh, really took off in the States uh, in the early 20th century. One of the major concerns here is agency cost theory, uh, or essentially, uh, you know, the control problem uh, between ownership and, uh, and management. And, and this is something that even uh, Adam Smith had recognized uh, in his treatises, uh, which I can get into a little bit later. But uh, now I think we've sort of moved beyond this managerial conception of business into a new world, or the sort of new digital corporation. And this chart kind of you know, shows the, the rise of intangibles in this new networked economy. So on the one hand, manual work versus immaterial work. 
geographical space versus cyberspace, structure, process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Well, this is because of globalization 4.0. Globalization being defined as a set of processes that embody a transformation in the spatial organization of social relations and transactions that generate transcontinental and interregional flows of activity, interaction, and power. That's David Held. In simple terms, uh, it's a form of new power. There have been four major uh, shifts or changes in the nature of globalization. Uh, I won't get into too much detail, but they are, they're called unbundlings. Uh, the first one was from 1820 to 1939, in which there was uh, global convergence, which is attributed to the new, the gold, rather, the gold standard. The second unbundling from 39 to 71, uh, in which the Bretton Woods institutions were formulated, uh, and then things happened. <laughs> Uh, then there's the third unbundling from 72 to 1990, and essentially um, there were, you know, what followed was a period known as high globalization, uh, the multinationalization uh, of global production and value chains, and the integration of financial markets, et cetera, et cetera. And now we live in an age of something that uh, Bronco Milanovic and Richard Baldwin recently argued uh, is called the new globalization, or globalization 4.0. What, what's the cause? Revolutionary changes in information and communications technology, uh, and, and a decisive shift in the balance of power between international capital and the democratic state. There's three essential uh, aspects to this, in my view. First, interestingly, uh, and we'll see how long this lasts, there's a global convergence, economically speaking. So between the Atlantic economies, which have traditionally been you know, the most developed and the most prosperous, and the rest, especially in Asia. But, interestingly, another aspect is increasing domestic inequality. So despite the fact that there's global convergence, which we could argue is a good thing, at the, in the domestic sense, inequality between the 1% and the 99% is, you know, and this is a great way to sum, I guess, sum up the, the concept, is radically uh, increasing. And then also, you know, the final, I guess, uh, aspect of this new globalization is the new knowledge paradigm we live in or this sort of fundamental transformation of what management and corporation are in this day and age. So, we get to platformization, the, the final, I think, aspect of, uh, of, of this evolution in forms of, so, or rather, uh, exchange of property. So basically, since the onset of the recession in 2008, I think there was initially these really high hopes for what the charity economy could do, or the ideals that it could sort of live up to. Uh, and this has sort of coincided with the, the growth, the rapid expansion of platforms, which are essentially infrastructures that enable two or more groups to, to interact, serving as intermediaries, or essentially digital matchmakers. Value in these platforms is created by these interactions, essentially. Uh, and in more technical terms, they can be thought uh, in terms of the way that they automate uh, exchanges and mediate social action. Um, and yeah, and I think really what this has done is it, it renders what previously would have been you know, a more formal, or rather informal exchange, for example, uh, between renting an apartment and someone in Paris versus uh, on Airbnb, into something which is a lot more mechanized and informal and follows certain rules of engagement, which are set by the platform themselves, often on the state. Uh, so essentially, what distinguishes these new platforms from normal corporations? I argue it's the fact that these platforms act as a pipeline. They eliminate traditional gatekeepers and subvert and disrupt traditional markets. They unlock new sources of value creation and supply, and they use database tools to create community feedback loops. So here we have the diagram that I constructed earlier. Um, so let's you know, put some or, uh, a little bit more detail on this. So here's an example of Airbnb. One side, you have travelers. The value proposition is lower prices. The market segment is travelers with lower budget. The value creation activity is the 6 to 12% fee. There's network, indirect network effects between travelers and renters. Value proposition, rent out to a global audience. Market segment, new short-term renters and professionals. Uh, value capture, 3% of booking fees. Indirect network effects here. And we have service providers on the other side. You know, cleaning ladies, for example, photographers, et cetera, et cetera. Value proposition, access wide customer base at low cost. Market segment, professionals and service companies. Uh, what's this one, PC? Sorry, value creation depends on service provider, et cetera, et cetera. Here we have the platform, Airbnb, public website. I mean, I don't want to read this all, but you know, public website for travelers, private website for renters, back office management for contracts, payments, services, reviews, lower marginal cost, higher billing than conventional welfare, or rather renter. All three of these segments feed information into the platform itself. 
renters, you know, they have offers on, on the site, destinations, information, help and forum, service providers provide external services, and travelers provide evaluation through reviews. So, yeah, there's a lot to say here. But essentially in my book I argue that there's three different type, uh, types of platforms that, are, that exist today. First, we have attention brokerages, which are comprised of firms like Facebook, Google, Twitter, etc. Uh, Tim Wu has done a lot of excellent scholarship on this, and essentially what they do is they capture user attention, or that's sort of the currency. Second, there's goods and services brokerages, so think Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, and what they essentially do is they're matchmakers, and they, they collect a fee on every transaction. And then there's also capital brokerages, which I won't talk about in this presentation, but you can think about things like Bitcoin. So yeah, this is a this is uh, Tim Wu did a really great uh, little diagram of what this is. So uh, AI, I mean, what I'll essentially say about this is, uh, you know, this traces back to the 1950s. Alan Turing uh, did some work on, you know, what the definition of artificial intelligence should be, uh, and he basically <laughs> defined artificial intelligence in terms of communication imitation. So uh, looking at, you know, whether according to a t uh, what is called a Turing test. Two people could essentially, uh, you know, communicate, uh, or a computer could convincingly communicate with another person. Uh, the basic point here is that algorithms, uh, which are processes or set of rules to define calculations and problem-solving operation, operations, are really the core engine of the development of this sort of multi-sided platform economy. And they use tools such as, you know, machine learning or neural nets or et cetera, et cetera, to try to to mimic uh, forms of human intelligence. Uh, and apply things and aggregate them at a much larger scale than would be ordinarily, uh, we'd ordinarily be capable. Uh, this is the Eliza chatbot. I think this is done in the 1980s. Uh, an example of someone interacting with a machine. Uh, I won't linger too long on this. Um, but one of the, I guess, the dark sides, or the what we're starting to see more increase or increasingly, is that there there is a dark side. There are, there are disbenefits to the AI economy. One of the reasons is uh, practitioners learn a little about social institutions. So computer engineers, for example, tend to learn you know, a little about the social or institutional processes uh, and, and how they apply in real life settings. Often, uh, human data, I mean, all, all, all of AI is based on human data. Uh, biased human data feeds into the algorithms themselves. Uh, here's a great example, you know, why are black women so? You know, this is from Safia uh, Umoja Noble's book, Algorithms and Oppression versus white women. You know, here's an example of biased data uh, producing biased results in algorithms. And the thing with algorithms, algorithms is that they govern and they have the po possibility to structure, or rather, they have the power to structure possibilities in our everyday life. Um, they do not simply accelerate co or commerce, journalism, and finance, and all these other domains, but rather, uh, they're increasingly uh, structuring social, rather social relations, how uh, information is produced, Surface seems legitimate and also ascribe public significance. Um, and okay, one of the major issues, as I hinted at, is this idea that states or rather firms are themselves emerging as kind of an economic actor themselves. Adolf Burl, uh, modern corporation and private property, long foresaw that in 1933. Uh, I think we can link, for example, tax evasion or this sort of uh, the democratic deficit. Uh, uh, you know, we can link it directly to increasing inequality at the domestic level. Um, but yeah, and I think that's sort of the, the main thrust of this, this trust in this theory is, is we need to think about how to democratize the corporation itself. Uh, here's just an incredible example of Apple, Microsoft, Google, Cisco, Oracle, Amazon, etc. Uh, offshoring is what these companies do to not pay taxes. And, you know, Apple, for example, offshores 92.8% of its income, Microsoft 93.9%. Uh, Cisco or Amazon, Amazon's on the side on this one, but Cisco 93.5. I mean, this is a very scary thing for democracy today and for the traditional redistributive function of the state. So the conclusion I'd say is again, <clears throat> the state is no longer the you know playing its traditional constitutive function. In this new polycentric order, we need to really think critically about how to divide the state's capacity uh, between market and state. I, I argue the state needs to bear greater responsibility and we as society need to enforce the terms of the equitable social contract. Um, what's really you know, potentially worrying is this collapse of the traditional distinctions in multi-sided markets. Think of you know, the relational dimension Aristotle talks about. Well, funny, a lot of these multi-sided markets uh, operate in data. You know, people go on looking for love. It's not necessarily a transaction. But they've reshaped uh, how people will approach relationships, for example. 
Um, and you know, of course, it's important to carefully assess the costs and benefits. So, how? Um, what is ethics? I think uh, you know, there's a, there's you know, ethics. I sort of foregrounded my definition of ethics. Uh, in general, we can think about it as the moral principles that govern a person's behavior. Um, there are five traditions that I draw on. I, I am not going to go into them at de in depth at all, but on the one hand, you have the ethics of consequence or utilitarianism. You have something called an ethics of duty called deontology, which comes from uh, Kant. Uh, you have an ethics of justice, which is John Rawls' social contract theory. Uh, feminist ethics of care, which is based on the notion of feminist relationality, and also something called the ethics of character, which derives from uh, Aristotle's uh, virtue ethics. Um, I don't have time to go into all of those, uh, but it, that, yeah, that's what I'll say. So then what is this business, e business ethics? So as I've derived uh, here, what we're really talking about is context of decision-making processes. <clears throat> we take an instrumental view of value judgment, uh, which really is about John Dewey's pragmatist moral epistemology. Um, what I argue is that this new business ethics is really something that's supposed to be focused on practical reason and discursive rationality. Um, and, and finally, um, this kind of practical reason, you know, there's no reason to, to choose one ethical theory over the other, etc. I think what we need to be doing is adopting a kind of pluralistic ethics, which takes its orientation to the proposed, the good, the just, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in, in, in these sort of uh, ethical traditions. So what I've derived is, uh, you know, seven essential rules, uh, which I won't, I'll, I'll explain them, or a few of them uh, in a moment, but what I try to do is synthesize, you know, based on my initial premise of, you know, taking Friedman's uh, approach to business ethics, is to try to synthesize what this means at every stage in the decision-making process going ex ante and ex post. So that's a lot of information here. Um, but essentially, the codification rule is really the, the crux of what I'm talking about. And what it argues is that in, in, in accordance with this concept of trust, business must exercise good faith in accordance with an internally de devised and institutionalized ethical code uh, comp comprised of individual virtues and collective values. The core concepts are efficiency, fairness, and equity. Um, and, um, and what I do in the book is I explain that these three principles, so for example, efficiency, translates into a concept of corporate social responsibility based on uh, you know, the school of utilitarianism. Uh, so some of the, the basic tenets of this would be uh, you know, to maximize profits uh, by ensuring the most productive use of resources, uh, to prohibit waste, which I think is the essence of what Friedman was saying, and to anticipate and or redress externalities of the firm. Um, the second major principle uh, I, did, I call fairness, which I think begets the necessity of transparency. And what the essential aspects of this are, you know, fairness in terms of treating people impartially in accordance with the standard of justice, honesty and trustworthiness, anti-discrimination, and adherence to the law. So this is really where Rawls comes through. And then the final aspect is equity, which begets accountability. And what I do to derive these kind of principles is I fuse Aristotle's virtue ethics with the feminist ethics of care. So the basic premises here are a concept of professional excellence, leadership, sociability, respect and concern for others, and also accountability. Um, I'm not going to go into too much into deal, detail with this, but the second aspect is casuistry, or using a case-based method to analyze context. So what I argue is, instead of thinking idealistically, as with, you would stockholder so theory or stakeholder theory, you know, pursue profit or think about everyone at the same time, business decision makers need to really look at the context and apply the principles to the facts. Uh, the second rule is, uh, is something I call the institutional rule. So what re this really addresses is the gap between the letter and the spirit of the law that we see and the sort of the flouting of the basic rules of society. Under this, uh, or the institutional rule, it's based on the premises of Pareto optimality, uh, in, a sense, in, in a sense making some better off while not making others wor worse off. And what I do is I devise something called the balancing of factors test. So this, these are a set of questions and a set of principles when you know, thinking about the constitution or rather the institution of a firm that decision makers must examine. So as, as an example, um, you know, in talking about control, I argue that uh, you know, economic rights and voting rights need to be fused or need to be aligned. So that's from an example earlier. Um, I think you know, with regard to data citizens and taxpayers and stakeholders, there needs to be an alignment of economic reality with the sort of the formal constitution of a corporation. And similarly, 
uh, in terms of, you know, just generally speaking, I think the firm needs to balance the distribution of social and economic benefits. Um, the transaction rule, uh, similarly, we're almost, yeah, we're almost getting to the end. Uh, the transaction rule, uh, basically, it addresses different aspects of the firm that I talked about earlier, contracting, market failures, privacy, AI, and taxation. And what I essentially devise here is something called the substance over form test. So inverting the sort of legalistic uh, approach and, and thinking equitably about how things uh, you know, ought to be arranged from an ethical perspective, addressing asymmetries of power, information, quality, choice of, of uh, contracting partners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I, those are the elements of the transaction rule. I can't go into all the details for that. Uh, the final aspect is execution, which is internal to the firm. And in this context, I argue that firms need to institutionalize new rules for ethics, diversity, and data protection. Finally, governance. I talk here a lot about the GDPR and emergent paradigms for privacy and security. And finally, in constitution, which is my favorite aspect of this whole project, is I adopt Aristotle's concept of morality as publicity. And what I argue is that in this era of stateless markets, you really need to think about citizenship in terms of deliberative capacity. And really, that is the crux from a realist perspective that we need to think about uh, in terms of how we can re-democratize the digital economy and you know, anticipate ethical risk and redress social inequities. Um, essentially, what this holds is that, as I've said, morality is a form of opinion in that it's incumbent at individuals as discur discursive agents in order to affect the, and enforce the equitable terms of the firm's social contract. Um, and you know, the best example I can think of is Susan Fowler, for example, who's now a journalist at the New York Times. You know, it, it, no one can push Travis Kalanick out, you know, not regulators, not courts, not anybody. What it was at the end of the road was the morality of opinion and, and simply her words. So I think that's something we need to focus on. Um, I'm almost ready for questions, but really quickly, Uber's post-IPO company values, I would revise them in accordance with the values I've, I've obviously suggested. In accordance with the pre-capital, pre-IPO capital structure, I would talk, you know, applying the test I devised, I'd say we need to align economic and governance rights. Uh, in terms of the contract, I'd apply the test I developed in the transaction rule. I think we need to look about substance over form and the, you know, the comparative case of taxi regulation to make this more ethical. In terms of taxes, transaction rule, I'd argue once again, we need to align the, the, you know, the economic reality of where these activities are taking place uh, and, and, and how they're represented on paper in order to respect the rights of data or other taxpayers and stakeholders. So that's it. Thank you guys so much for listening. I'm just going to put a piece of paper here and we can start taking some questions. I'll, uh, I'll get a list going and we're going to take three at a time so that Michael can, uh, can think about it. Okay, so I saw hands here and here. 